We are working today uh, part two of a message that we looked at last week from 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 8 through 10. Last week we looked at verses 8, verse 8 should I say. Today we're looking at verses 9 and 10 together. Again, my prayer uh, would be that we would again come to God's word and set it before us knowing that God's word is truth. And that truth must be taught plainly uh, and simply as the text expects of us. And so today, like any other Lord's Day teaching, I would pray that you would open your hearts to God's Word and that His Word would have its way in your life. Let's read from God's inspired Word. Verse 8 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. <coughs> Do not be therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. God who saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And now is made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Who has abolished death, has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. May the word of the Lord be established in our hearts and produce reverence for him this day. Amen. Well, as many of us know, uh, as we have been working through our way through ch chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, that this is Paul's final letter to Timothy. Paul is a prisoner in Rome. He's writing from prison. We don't know whether, you know, Luke is with him. We don't know whether Luke's actually writing and documenting for him. But we know that this letter is finally delivered by Tychicus to um, Timothy in Ephesus. And Timothy is reading these words for himself and publicly to the church. And they are written primarily to Timothy, but also to the church. They encourage Timothy, but they also bring doctrine and uh, truth to the church. Paul is... Uh, at a very high point, he's about to live his last days on earth and go to be with the Lord. Yet, he looks back and uh, has great joy for uh, what he's seen and sorrow in that many have departed from him. Physically, he is suffering. Spiritually, he has suffered. Many have left him that have been once faithful in the faith, the presence of the demons, and uh, many others that have left Paul those he sowed his life into. So there's a real tension here where Paul has been suffering and in verse 8 he has invited Timothy into that suffering. He's invited him in and said, you're going to be partakers of me in that suffering. Indeed, Paul was called to suffer. Maybe we can turn back again to Acts chapter 9 where Ananias is told to remind Paul, and this is going to build into our teaching today, verses 9 through 10, where the Lord commands Ananias to speak. To Paul and say, in verse, pick it up in verse 15, Go your way, Ananias, for he, Paul, is a chosen vessel to me. And God's chosen him, and he's chosen Paul for his purposes. We see here as we follow on to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Verse 16, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, this suffering isn't for Paul, it's for the whole church. At this point, we see that Christianity is a despised religion. It always has been, but Back in the early days of Christianity, particularly in the first 200 quarter of the century, we see that Christianity was particularly persecuted 
uh, through the, and from the Roman Empire, many of the Caesars were not just uh, against Christianity, they were pagan, but they were um, proactively persecuting Christians. Christians were hated, despised, ridiculed, and uh, this is why Timothy is told to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Uh, the early Christians knew they were in a battle. They didn't have to be reminded. They knew that their lives were at risk. That there was a battle raging and Christians were aware that they had to stand or fall. Unlike today's modern day Christianity where we simply live our lives and tend to bolt on our Christian witness as a form of convenience. So we need to step away from that. Last week we spoke uh, directly to that. Uh, it would be 200, nearly 250 years, a quarter of a century, until the early church from the time of Christ would actually find some form of reprieve under Constantine's reign, uh, 306 AD, that began. Until then, we continue to be reminded in Scripture that all those who live God in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So if you accurately represent the gospel, there is going to be a level of suffering personally and spiritually, that you are called to bear. Now, take heart, because Christ himself says that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Notice that we are yoked together with Christ in this, and that's what makes it easy and light. The fact that we have the assurance that he is with us. Now, if we were doing this on our own, we'd have every reason to feel the yoke heavy uh, and burdensome. And it wouldn't be easy. But the fact that Christ, saints, is with us through this, it should give us great hope that through all the, the, the issues that we may face as Christians in this life, we have the great hope that no matter what we face, no matter where we are, no, no matter who we gather with as believers, Christ is present with us. Okay, so our overview again. If you've got notes from last week, it's the same this week. The verse 8 that we looked at last week was the testimony of the gospel. And the testimony of the gospel in verse 8, that is we would endure through suffering. We would overcome in suffering. And we are Christ's prisoners in this suffering. Paul was not a prisoner of Nero. He was not a prisoner of Rome. He was a prisoner of Christ. He was bound in the spirit, Acts 20, to do Christ's bidding. He may have been locked up in the Manatee prison. He may have been, uh, in reality, uh, a prisoner of Rome, but he was more so a prisoner of Christ to do the Lord's bidding, not Rome's. Secondly, today we'll look at uh, point two and three, the calling of the gospel. We're all called as Christians. We're going to look at how we were called, when we were called, and then verse 10, we're going to look at who we're called to serve in the gospel. It's a holy calling. It's not just any calling. It is a holy, a high and holy calling. And we're called to serve the gospel. We're called to serve none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, who appeared and made the gospel visible. And we're to walk as he walked. We're to follow Christ. And this is what it is to live out our calling and to commit our way to the Lord so that he would fulfill all that we are called to do for him, for his glory's sake in our lives. The main point being, we are called sovereignly to both salvation and suffering for the gospel's sake. Let me say that again. We are called both sovereignly, so God calls us to do two things here in this short passage, to both salvation and and suffering. God has both saved us and called us to suffer for his name's sake. We just saw that in Acts 9. God's very clear as he says to Ananias, go to Paul, I have both chosen him and called him to suffer and bear my name uh, to the Gentiles and to all of Israel for my name's sake. This pattern for Paul is the same pattern for Timothy, which is why Timothy is invited to partake into this process that Paul's about to unpack. And you too, saint, have been called the same way 
brought into this faith the same way and must be prepared to suffer for the Lord's sake in the same way. We're all one body. We're all in one in spirit, one in the same faith. We've all been baptised into the same baptism, the suffering of the Lord. Remember, we're not just baptised in water. We'll have our new baptism already here soon. We're not just baptised in water. We're baptised also into his sufferings. Remember the verse that says, can you be, can you be baptised in the baptism we're in, we're in I'm baptised into? He's talking about suffering there. He's not talking about water. Are you ready to be immersed into the life of Christ? Well, I just want to touch a little bit on Sunday and then step away and walk away and live my own life. No, as a Christian, we're baptised. The word baptism over there is immersed fully. It's the, the Greek word is to immerse into, like a cloth is dipped into a different colour and it comes out a whole different shape. We're baptised into not only his life, but his death. If you want Christ, you need to taste all of him. Many are offended when the Lord says that you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. He's saying you can't just have the good stuff. You can't just have the blessing. You've got to be prepared for the suffering also. Again, last week, this is why we talked about why the issue of prosperity gospel is such an issue. Because we can't just preach a one-sided gospel. Yes, Christ has blessed us in the gospel. Amen? And our soul should prosper. But we're also called to suffer. And friends, if we have a Christianity where we get to the pointy end of the stick and we're suffering, we're saying, well, God, what are you doing to me? Why am I suffering? We've been taught a one-sided gospel. And friends, a one-sided gospel is no gospel at all. It's a false gospel. We need to recognize that we're not only blessed in Christ, but God has given us a spirit to suffer according to the afflictions of the gospel. That's the teaching of scripture right before us. And friends, remember, no matter what a person may preach or teach, we must come back to the sure foundation of scripture and test it according to scripture. And today we're going to do the same in seeing how God himself saves us and calls us to this gospel calling to honour him by living holy lives and preaching and suffering for his name's sake. Okay, not a popular message I get. Maybe not a feel-good message, but today I hope and pray that our eyes would be opened, our ears would be unstopped, and we would again see the great God who saved us out of our own sins. Well, let's get into our text this morning. Verse 9. This God who saved us, has saved us, and called us. I need you to see there the end. You can't say that God has saved you without saying that he hasn't also called you. Everyone that God saves, he calls. He calls, and he's called us with a particular calling. Can you note everyone in your Bible? It's a holy calling. It's not just a a vocational calling to get a job done. It's a holy calling. Can I say this? God's interested in your holiness first rather than what you'll do for Him. You're called, and yes, you're called to do good works that He's ordained for you to walk in, but God's more interested in your holiness than He is in your productiveness. So first and foremost, the calling of God is a holy calling. The only vessels that get into God's temple are holy vessels. So let's remember, God has saved us. A holy God has saved us. A holy God has called us. And we must represent that calling by living holy lives ourselves. Now notice it's a lowercase h. It's not the capital H that the angels called out in Isaiah where they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We will never attain to the holiness of God Almighty. Can I get an amen there? You'll never do it. Try as hard as you will. But it's a lowercase name. So we are called to live holy lives. And the direction of our life should attain to more and more holiness. Uh, okay, again, we, if we had time, we could go to Scripture and Scripture. We'll do that more on Wednesday night as we dig around in this 
two verses. And this holy calling is not, verse 8, follow me, not according to our works. So you were saved and called, negative here, just so we don't mistake it, not according to our works, but according, so there's two accordings. He gives the negative first, don't think it was anything to do with you, because it wasn't, but according to his own purpose and grace. Okay, so God decided, God purposed, and out of God's grace, and notice God's grace which was given us. So this salvation, this calling was given. It was given to you. This is what grace is, isn't it? Grace isn't something we take. Grace isn't something we deserve. Grace is undeserved. Grace is given. And Paul layers this. The grace that was given. It's a double imperative. The grace that was given. And who was it given in? Christ Jesus. So you don't get this grace any other way. Salvation is in everyone. Christ alone. We receive grace in Christ alone. Through God the Father who gave us His Son. We'll see in verse 10 what that looked like when Christ appeared. And this was done when? Before the world began. Plain teaching of Scripture. So Paul is now unpacking how the gospel works. In essence, he's explaining both who saves and how we are saved. The process, if you like. It's a systematic theology in one little verse here. <laughs> a couple little verses. This is a really uh, intensive tablet of two verses that once it dissolves into your system, it has all sorts of ramifications. It has all sorts of effects. Some Christians, and I'm sure you've heard this, make the assumption that when they preach to someone, maybe that person has made some kind of response to Christ, and now they're following Jesus. It is commonly said of that person that preached to them that they have saved them. Have you heard that before? I prayed with them, and you know, I got them saved. I, I saved that person when I prayed, and they accepted the Lord as their Savior. Now, although it is good to share our faith, absolutely, and it is great to pray with people that they might know Christ as Savior. It is clear in verse 9 who actually does the saving. Can you see it there? God who saved us according to the power of God, the afflictions of the gospel, the suffering, the, um, sorry, let me go back, the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God doesn't finish. You don't have a full stop at the end of that verse. Who has saved us and called us. It's clear who does the saving. God. So it is God who saves us and He does this when He calls us. It's realized as we hear the calling of God to our own hearts. It's what is called in the reformed world the irresistible calling. Well, you know, Pastor Wayne, why is it called irresistible calling? Um, although many hear the outward call of the gospel, because we're told to preach the gospel to everyone, aren't we? They hear the gospel with their own physical ears. This calling that's being referenced here is called, saved and called. This reference is an inner calling. An inner calling. A drawing of the Spirit which a man cannot run from or deny. For when God calls us by a convicting work of His Spirit and shows us our need of Christ through the Gospel message, the fact that we are sinners and Christ has died for us and we can be saved, it becomes irresistible. It's like a moth to a flame. How could I turn away from that? Indeed, what has happened is God has regenerated and made alive our own hearts and therefore we can respond to the call. We are drawn in and we are called. And this is a work of God. I think if anybody in this room says that God doesn't save them, they would actually be a heretic. Because you can't save yourself. So let's go to a, a couple of verses here where Jesus teaches how this works um, in John 6. Interestingly, at the end of this passage, 
those who aren't saved believe Christ. So there are simply ramifications as the Lord is teaching this. And these people walk away from Christ who were disciples and knew him, followed him, saw his miracles. In John 6, verse 44, this is very strong teaching. In many ways, if you've not bought into how salvation works according to Jesus, you will be offended. Jesus says in John 6, 44, no one, well that's the imperative, no one means no one, can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You can't come to Christ unless the Father draws you. And I will raise him the last day. Well, this shows that anyone who comes to Christ will make it through the last day, or else Christ is lying. Just this whole teaching in itself is proof that those who the Father gives to the Son will not be lost. Amen? Yeah. Or else Christ is lying here in this verse. He'll raise him up the last day. Also, let's go down the same chapter to verse 65. Then Jesus, uh, then Jesus said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless what? Unless the Father has granted this to him. Verse 66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And Jesus said to the twelve, Would you, you also go away? And Simon answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil, but still one to leave. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon. For it was for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Wow, there's a sobering start to today's message. Friends, if you have been saved and called by God, it had nothing to do with you, and it had everything to do with God. You coming to Christ, the Father granted it and enabled you to do that. Notice the order cannot be missed here. We must actually be saved by God, internally regenerated, made alive spiritually, or we would not be able to respond to the calling of God. We must be made alive first so that we can be given ears to hear and eyes to see, and then we respond. The ordering is right. We must be saved first, and then when we are made alive or regenerated, Genesis, given life, made alive, regenerated. We were dead, but now we've been made alive, regenerated. And this is the case even physically when we think of the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus is dead. He's been dead three days. There is a, apparently, according to Mary and Martha, no hope for him. But while Christ is speaking to the Jews around him, just the will of Christ alone, Christ doesn't even have to speak the words, Lazarus has come to life in the grave. And it only takes Christ to then say, Lazarus, come forth. And the response is there because he's already alive. He can respond and get out of his grave clothes and fight out of his grave clothes to get out. We have been made alive first. God regenerates our hearts, something we would agree we can't do. We can't make our heart that is dead in sin alive. And this is the beautiful process that we see. We are, verse 10, given both light, life, and then light. You notice the order there in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. We're firstly given life, and then we're given immortality and light through the gospel. You must be made alive first so that you can see the light of the glorious gospel. And so I would argue as far as this. When I recognised that I needed Christ in my hotel room when I was travelling in Sydney with a band touring Australia, and I recognised, now I realised doctrinally, 
what had happened in my own heart, sometime, half an hour, an hour, whatever time it was before that, God had done a work in my heart and regenerated me and I became aware of my sin and that I was being called to a holy life and I was being called to follow Christ. God had done that work in me and therefore I could claim no work that I had done was attributed to that. Or else I could boast. This is the same process for each one of us coming to Christ. We're internally regenerated and we've been blinded by our sin. The Prince of power of this world has blinded the minds of every unbeliever and it takes God to unblind them to our need of Christ and to hear the call of repentance. In the negative, look at what Paul does here in verse 9. Not according to our works. He's taking away every other reason that we might think that God might call us or choose us for salvation. I'm a pretty good person. I've done a lot of good things. I think God might think I'm pretty cool. Why wouldn't he call me? I've got a lot to contribute. I've got a lot to bring the kingdom. Why wouldn't God call me? No, it's not according to our works. Saints, nothing you can do can make you more acceptable to God to fit you for salvation. And Paul's going to remove every excuse in a moment because he's saying this was all done when? Before the world began. Oh, that really brings us of every excuse to say it wasn't me because I wasn't even around. <laughs> okay, friends, we're sunk. This was all done before the world began. In fact, even if we were to say it was good works, Isaiah removes that and says all of your good works amount to what? A bunch of filthy rags that I'm not even interested in. They stink to me. They're an abomination to me. They're dirty, filthy to me. So nothing you did or have ever done. And friends, when we stand before God the Father, there will be nothing that we've done that God is interested in, in a sense that it merits us for salvation. He'll be interested, as we discussed yesterday in chapter 16 of the London Baptist Confession, he'll be interested in rewarding us according to our good works, but we will not merit salvation according to our good works. Our salvation will be merited already in Christ alone. So when you stand before God the Father in heaven, you do not need to fear that God will say, you uh, basically didn't work hard enough to get salvation, which is pretty much every other religion on planet Earth. You are saved in Christ. You are in Him, you are clothed in His righteousness. Now you will be rewarded according to your own good works. Therein comes the holy living, obedience to God, and honouring Him in your life. And obedience to God's word. And you'll be rewarded. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Some of us will receive gold, some silver, some precious stones. Some of you will get into heaven and be smelling like you probably almost nearly went to hell. By flames alone. It will all be disappeared and burned away because... You were doing it for yourself or whatever that might have been. Friends, if it was by works that God chose us and called us to himself, we would have reason for boasting, wouldn't we? Maybe we can turn to Ephesians 2 for a moment. Ephesians 2. So we can take it from other parts of scripture as well. Verses 8, for by grace you are saved. The grace thing coming through in salvation is given to you. Through faith. Who gives us faith? God has to do that as well. So he gives us the grace, he gives us the faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So grace, faith, but it's the gift of God. Not of works, double imperative, lest any man should boast. So we're clear there. It's of God. Maybe let's go back to the Old Testament. See how God worked there. It's not just a New Testament thing. 
Let's look at Israel, God's chosen people. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Let's pick it up in verse 6. Look for key words here that we've already got in the New Testament as well. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. There's the calling. The people of God should be a holy people. The Lord your God has what? Chosen you to be a special people to himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So God is going to make uh, a an issue of Israel. He's going to say, they're my people. I'm going to and have a look here. Verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For you were the fewest of all people. What is he doing? He's taking away every excuse here that they would say, well, God, you chose us because we were a great nation. No, you were the fewest in number. But because the Lord loved you and because you would keep, he would keep the oath which he had sworn to your fathers, has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of the bondman from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt? Know therefore that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. This is the process that God has established from Israel right through to the end of time. A thousand generations is a way to say, this is the way I work with all my people. Israel, the New Testament covenant people, God is a covenant keeping God, amen. And He keeps covenant to a thousand generations. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the Lord, I do not change. And God chooses a people, He chooses you. There are holy people, we're a holy people. We're called to live and serve and obey a covenant keeping God according to His word. And we're chosen out of love. So the fact that God chooses us, or if you like, other words in the Bible are elects us, He chooses us. When you are elected, you're chosen in a political race. People have to elect who they want, and that person that is elected, they're chosen by the people. In this case, God chooses His people, it's reversed, and we ultimately receive the grace and the faith to then serve Him. And this is the way God has always worked, not of ourselves, not because we're greater, not of our works, lest if it was, any of us could boast. So we know now who causes this, who causes this salvation God does. He's the great initiator. He's the author and finisher of our faith. But when does it happen? Well, in actual fact, uh, although it technically happens in time when we become saved, so to speak, we need to say it rather happened. Doctrinally, we can make distinctions. We're allowed to, theologians can do that. And of course, biblically, Paul makes the distinction. It's not just that, Timothy, you are saved. But Paul goes into depth saying, Timothy, this is when it all happened. And he speaks in the verse in past tense. You've been called. You've been saved. So when does this happen? Well, the, the teaching is very clear. It happened before the foundation of the world. Before the world was even brought into being. Wow. Let's wind back the clock of time. Let's not go back to ancient Rome. Let's not go back to Adam and Eve. Let's not go back before where there was nothing. But we're going to go back to eternity past. Where God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit dwell in eternity, happily, they don't need you. They don't want to shock you, but they don't need you. They don't even need a world, but they've created a world to show off the beauty of Christ and the gospel and how great our God is. And they do that out of their own purpose and good pleasure. And so what happens? According to Paul and the eternal purposes of God, which many of them are, of course, a mystery to us, it was decided. In actual fact, look at your verse. It was purpose in grace. And you can see that there. To his own purpose 
and grace. According to God's gracious purposes, what does God do? He decides, He purposes in grace because He doesn't have to. Who Christ would die for? Who Christ would save? And in time, show His grace upon us vessels of mercy and grace. This is the plain teaching of what we call sovereign grace. God, all powerful, can do as He wills, He can choose whoever He wants, clearly saves and calls those He chooses. To say choose also indemnifies the fact that if you choose something, it means what? There are others you might not choose. And this is God's prerogative because He's God. We are vessels. We are His creation. He is the Creator. He owns us. He can do what He wants with His creation. Right, everyone? Yes. He's God. Who is the uh, who is the vessel to say back to the potter? Who is the clay to say back to the potter? What are you doing? Paul makes it clear it's blasphemous behaviour to say, God, who are you do choose or not choose? Well, that's God's prerogative to do that. And as Paul explains in Romans 9, he does that before even any of the children were born. In Jeremiah, he says, before, or when I was in my mother's womb, you had already ordained me to be a prophet. You already knew I was called to be a prophet. Before having done any right or wrong, it was chosen. Listen to how our London Baptist Confession puts it in chapter 3, section 5. Those of mankind that are predestined to life, God before the foundation of the world was laid according to his eternal and mutable purpose, the secret counsel and the good pleasure of his will, has chosen us in Christ to everlasting glory. And he does this, according to the confession, out of his mere free grace and love, without any other thing in the creature that is you or I, as a condition or cause, moving him thereunto. There's nothing we can do to affect God's predetermined decision, his saving purpose. When God purposes something, he won't change his mind, or else he's not God anymore. Okay, Wayne, where else is it saying this whole world began thing in Scripture? Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 4. We've got to use the the Puritan method, the classic time-tested orthodox method of interpreting the Bible. Scripture interprets Scripture. The more we look at Scripture, the plainer it should become. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. According as He has chosen us in Christ, in Him, when? Before the foundation of the world. That we should be what? Holy. See the key words? God's called us to a holy calling. When did he do it? Before the foundation of the world, he chose us. Well, God's an omniscient God. He, he's all-knowing. Yes, God can look down the tunnel of time and see every family. He knew your name. He knew what age you would die at because it's all written in his book. He knows it all. He's a smart God. You can't mock him. You can't fool him. He knows everything. He knows everyone. He already knows the whole unpacking of all of human history. And only according to Jesus does the Father know the day and the time of Christ coming to the earth to come for his saints and Lord, may that be so. Okay, you're not convincing me. Let's go to Romans 8. These are all different letters, different teachings. Peter teaches this, John teaches this, Paul teaches this. Jesus teaches this, of course. Romans 8. Paul's teaching it to the church at Rome as an established fact. And in verse 28, and we know, you guys should know this, we're covering old ground here, and we know that God. Right? Not anyone else. God works all things together. That's everything in human history. This is the doctrine of providence. God works all things together for the good of those who love Him. This is a Christian doctrine now. Who are called according to His gracious purpose. 
All these words are recurring. For those whom God foreknew, he also did predestine to be what? Conformed to the image of his son. Right there in that line is the call to holiness. God knew you, and that's why he predestined you. He knew your name before it, before in eternity past, before the world began. He knew you because he named you. He knew your name. He put you in his book. And therefore you were predestined to be called, to be conformed to the image of his son. We all have the same calling, everyone. None of us are called to different things. We're all called to follow Christ. And our first and priority call is to holiness. A holy calling. Because you're no good to God without living a holy life first. Everything you do is going to not be good if you're not living a holy life. That he, that is Christ, would be the firstborn among many brothers. And look at the process one more time in case you're unsure of it in verse 30. So those who he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. There's the whole process. And by the way, there's no one predestined that's not called. There's no one called that's not justified. There's no one justified that doesn't make it to glory and make it to heaven's gates. So everyone that's predestined makes it all the way through to heaven's gates. Amen? Or else Paul's a liar. And scripture isn't inspired. And it's not true. It's lying to us. Friends, I want you to know if some of you are sitting there and saying, why isn't sanctification on that list? Because sanctification is something you contribute to by proving your obedience to God. That's why sanctification is not on this list. What's on this list is everything God does. And you don't contribute to it. God predestined you. God calls you. God justifies you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And He brings you home to glory. And therefore, when we get to heaven... We have only one thing to do. Take our crowns and not stand in front of Christ and God the Father and say, I'm worthy of this crown. When you get to heaven, you will truly know it. You will cast it down at the Lord's feet and say, Lord, I got here because of you and your grace alone. Your predestiny purposes alone. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. I'm almost going to have to do a part three of this message. Not even into the next verse yet. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we should always thank God for you, brothers who are loved by the Lord. How are we loved by the Lord? Because God has chosen you. When? From the beginning. God did it. You didn't do it. You didn't choose God in time. God chose you from the beginning to be saved by the sanctification of the Spirit, by faith and the truth. We could go to John 17, 24. Father, I will that they also whom you have given me, so the Father gives an elect group to the Son, to be with me where I am, where they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before that foundation of the world. And that same love was modelled and shown upon Christ when the Father gave him the many sons and daughters who would come to glory as the reason and the purpose that Christ would die for. So let me get this clear. Before Christ even took on flesh, which Paul's about to get to in verse 10, Christ already knew who he was coming to die for and live for so that there was purpose in everything Christ did. This is why the book of Philippians says that for the joy set before him. What joy? The cross isn't a joyful experience. The crown of thorns thrust and torn into his scalp wasn't a joyful experience. The nails through his hand and the the nails through his feet and the spear through his side is not, I repeat, a joyful experience. The joy that Christ went to the cross for, saints, was the joy of knowing that he would bring you into his kingdom and you would be conformed to his image and likeness and that we together in Christ would bring glory to the Father and that was worth the pain of suffering 
to bring you into the throne room of grace this day. Friends, if you don't sense the graciousness of God the Father, right here, right now, after the teaching of this doctrine, I'm not sure what will actually bring that to you. Maybe let's turn to Revelation 17, 8. So we think about closing up our sermon this morning, Revelation 17, 8. Friends, if anything, this is great cause to bring us humility, isn't it? That God would choose us and we contributed nothing. You know, when I realise again, even afresh as I'm even teaching this this morning, it humbles me, it weakens my knees, it causes me to get just weeping because I, I can tend to think there's something in me that God really likes. But friends, in all reality, there's nothing in me that attracted God to save me. I was a broken fallen, sinful man. And by rights, left to my own sinful lifestyle, I would have never chosen God. I loved my sin. I loved my lifestyle. I loved what I was doing. I loved it. Yet God came into my heart, changed it. He actually changed the disposition of our heart, my heart, so that I hated what I loved, and I began to love what I previously hated. I was running from God, and now I wanted to run to Him. Only God can do that. That's the proof of a true, born again heart. Do you know what Jesus says to Nicodemus? You must be born again. The literal rendering of that in the Greek is you must be born from above. You must be born from above. You must be granted it from the Father in heaven so that you may know what it is to be born a second time spiritually. You were born naturally, you need to be born spiritually. You can only be born spiritually if it is granted to you from the Father that you can come to me. Other than that, you can't come to me. And by the way, we're predestined in love. This is a loving doctrine. Paul said, you're predestined in love. So to say that predestination is not a loving doctrine, quite frankly, is to contradict Scripture. And I don't want to contradict Scripture. But when Paul says that we are predestined in love, election and predestination is one of the most loving doctrines in all the Bible. Because let's be honest, if God left all of mankind and didn't predestine anyone, none of us would make it to heaven. If God didn't choose us and we had to choose Him, none of us would make it to heaven. Heaven would be an empty place and heaven would be filled to the brim. God is a loving God. How does God show His grace? Apart from saving sinners. We wouldn't know God by His grace. How does God show His wrath? By damning sinful men in their own sins. So it is a very, very powerful doctrine. Revelation 17, 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out to the bottom of his pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Whose names were not. Now the scripture is clear. There are a list of names written in the Lamb's book of life, and there are a list of names who are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And this is done when? Before the foundation of the world. Friends, we either believe scripture or we don't. Is it getting too hard for you to believe scripture now? Do you think you know better than God? And you think, no, God can't be like that. I don't believe scripture. No, scripture sufficiently shows us how God operates. Both in salvation and even in reprobation. In saving and damning. And what God does is just and right. To say he's doing it wrong is saying he's not just, he's not right, he's not good. And I don't know whether you want to go out on that limb today. I don't. You must believe and trust the scriptures because they teach the plain way.
pray that God doesn't. And if we think there's something wrong, the problem's with us, not God. The problem's with you, not with God's Word. So we must always say, God, okay. It's like doing exams. I think I got that question right. Go back to the answer book. The answer book says you got it wrong. You just don't know how you got it wrong, but you got it wrong. And friends, this is why we must submit to God's word to do so is pride, to not do so is prideful. Friends and saints here today, let us give glory to God that it is He who from the beginning to end is the author and finisher of our faith. He has sovereignly designed salvation. He sovereignly initiates and sustains and completes salvation. He's forgiven us, justified us, delivered us from sin and Satan, from death and hell. In every sense and in every tense, past, present and future, God is our Saviour. And friends, next week, because just I'm not even going to get to it this week, verse 10, please accept my apologies, but I can't rush when I'm there, what this gospel looks like. Let's have a quick sneak peek in verse 10. This gospel that we're to suffer for, in verse 10, is now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. So not only are we told, not only is it a mystery in ages past, the gospel is made visible in Jesus. The saving mechanism of God saving us and calling us will be the manifestation of none other than His only Son, so that it's made clear and beyond excuse in human history that God will come into human history, invest Himself, Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, Christ will be born of a virgin, and the Gospel will be made visible in His only Son. It's only going to happen once, and it's going to happen in Christ, and He will die once and for all for the people whom He will save. And Jesus, notice this in verse 10, a little window into that next week. Jesus will accomplish what? He will abolish death. Here's the gospel. You were dead in your sins, but Jesus is going to deal with that. He's going to deal with the second death. We'll all die a natural death. We'll all die physically. But Jesus, praise be to his name, will abolish the second death. We don't have to go to hell and die a second death eternally. Because in Him we are given life, spiritual life, and immortality. Saints, in Christ you will live forever. With Him in glory. And there's only one mechanism in how we get there. We're given not just life, but light through the gospel message. And Jesus is that gospel message made visible that we preach throughout all generations until he comes back for his church. Wow. Don't tell me there ain't meat on these bones. And there's so much more for us to dig around in. Until then, how about we uh, bow our heads in a word of prayer?